Well, originally I had picked a verse that's pretty close to the one you had picked, but I'm going to call an audible and I'm going to pick oh. a different one. <laughs> Omaha Blue 42. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bible Geeks Weekly Podcast. This is episode 53. I'm Brian Sheely. I'm Ryan Choi. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We're in week eight of the End of the Book Bible Reading Program. That's in Acts chapters 12 through 16. There's a lot going on in this section of scriptures here, especially with the persecution that the people are facing. Yeah, the the gospel is meeting opposition at every turn, and yet, these guys just keep speaking and the gospel keeps spreading. It's a, it's a really kind of a heroic tale that you're you're seeing spun here as the account takes Paul and and all these other guys through beatings, imprisonments, mm-hmm. stonings and they just yeah. the the phrase that keeps coming up and the gospel continue to spread and they kept speaking yep. over and over again. Yeah. It's good stuff, especially in thinking about the various difficulties we may have today, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. But before we begin, let's get into our Finding Jesus segment. So we're in Acts chapters 12 through 16 this week. Where do you find Jesus in these verses? I find Jesus in the work that Paul and Barnabas are doing, Mm -hmm. interestingly. So Paul is giving this really amazing sermon that I think gets to all the elements of the gospel in a in a really enlightening way, pulling in scripture to support and strengthen all of the, the core events of, of Christ's work. And then as the Jews reject the gospel, at least many of them, Paul says, okay, I had to speak to you guys first, but now you've decided you're unworthy of eternal life, so I'm turning to the Gentiles. And then he quotes this passage about Jesus. It's this passage from Isaiah 49, verse 6, where it's it's one of the pictures of the servant in the book of Isaiah. So this is definitely about Jesus. And yet, Paul seems to apply this to himself. He says, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Again, in the context of Isaiah, He's talking about Jesus. I have made you, Jesus, a light for the Gentiles or for the nations that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. But Paul says this is a command to him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool because it, it shows what we've been saying all along about the book of Acts and about the story it's telling that Jesus began to do a good work. But he's still doing that work in his body and his body is now, you might think, well, his resurrected body is now at the right hand of God, but he now has a body on earth that's still doing his work, and that's that's the church. And so we find Christ and the light that, that God the Father has made Jesus to be to the nations in the work that Jesus continues to do through his people as the gospel spreads, as, as we, his body, are a light, as Christ is being a light to the nations through him. I think that's really cool, that way that you can't really separate Jesus from his people, because when we're doing the Lord's work, really it's, it's him doing that work in us. Yeah, and that was his instruction, right, to them before he left. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature or to every nation that's their job and the end of that commission that you just quoted from matthew 28 is and i will be with you always to the end of the age so again this idea that as they're teaching as they're preaching baptizing people the lord is with them the lord is working with them i i and i think that's that's really interesting so where did you find jesus in these chapters Well, originally I had picked a verse that's pretty close to the one you had picked, but I'm going to call an audible and I'm going to pick a different one. (laughs) Omaha Blue 42. (laughs) All right. So we're in Acts chapter 16, and this is the account of Paul and Silas right before they get thrown into prison, actually, for doing this very miracle that we're about to talk about. In verse 16 of Acts 16, it says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, 
These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Does this sound at all familiar to any of the miracles that Jesus had done and all of his interactions with evil spirits and people who were demon possessed? Yeah. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High? Exactly. And so in verse 18, and this she kept doing for many days, Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very hour. We saw a few times in Jesus' ministry, especially with his apostles, who they were unable to cast out certain demons because of their lack of faith. And he points that out to them. But here, Paul basically is kind of annoyed by this demon who just keeps following him, essentially saying that they're servants of the Most High God. And (laughs) finally just turns around and in the name of Jesus Christ, cast this demon out. And everyone was amazed, I'm sure, when, when they saw this. But the fact was, the power to do this was not in and of himself. He calls mm-hmm. on Jesus' name to actually make this happen. Mm-hmm. Paul was not somebody who had this kind of power in and of himself. This was not his special ability to do this. This came as a result of his relationship, his service to the Lord. And so he uses Jesus' name as the motivator for this spirit to be cast out of this girl. The demons know who Jesus is, that's for sure. Yeah. It makes me think of the story we're going to read next week about, <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly where I'm the going, seven right? seven sons of Skiva. <laughs> yeah, it's so oh, good. Man. It's one so, of my favorites. I mean, you can't, you, whenever you talk about how the demons know Jesus' name, there's, there's this story <laughs> where these guys are trying to cast out demons by, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And uh, the, an evil spirit finally says to him, Jesus, I know. <laughs> Paul, Paul I, recognize, I, recognize. I recognize that guy, but who are you? And then he just jumps on him and, you know, I shouldn't laugh at that last part, the evil spirit jumping on him and, and mastering him, but... I'm pretty sure it was there intended to make us laugh just a little bit. I, I'm, I have yeah, a feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I have a feeling Luke might have been chuckling as he, he wrote it through the <laughs> spirit's uh, guidance. Yeah, it's just amazing how well... Everyone in that realm right beyond what we can see knows exactly who the Lord of all is. Mm -hmm. And they know who his servants are. They know who Paul is. They know all of his servants. They can they can see right through us to that spiritual place, that spiritual bond we have with the Lord and what we're doing, the fruit we're bringing for the Lord. And they know who is not his. Let's get into our second segment. And that is scripture du jour. What is the soup du jour? It's the soup of the day. Mm, that sounds good. I'll have that. We're in Acts chapter 15 today on Thursday in week eight of our reading. What do you get from Acts chapter 15 that really kind of stands out to you? You know, in the spirit of uh, your Blue 42 audible, I think I'll audible too and go to <laughs> something. I was going to talk about James' quote from the scriptures, which I think is interesting, but mm-hmm. I also just love what Peter says. It's, it's so simple, and he states what we'll later read Paul arguing in great detail, but this, this is pretty interesting as he explains the problems with the efforts these Judaizing teachers are making to, to bind the law of Moses on the Gentiles, and he says, now therefore, in verse 10, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Mm-hmm. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Boom. Boom. <laughs> we can't bear it. We haven't perfectly kept the law. We haven't been able to hold up under the yoke of this, which Paul will argue that's part of the point of the law is... You're going to point, it's going to point out sin and it's going to point out this fact that we are all the same and we all will need to rely on our faith and the grace of the Lord to save us. The Jew first and also to the Gentiles, this is the message that we we put our faith and our trust and our loyalty, our obedience to Jesus, and we just trust that 
his grace is sufficient where we are not. Why do you think people were so insistent that the Gentiles had to be circumcised to be saved? Why were they making such a stand on why was this their hill to die on really well it's the mark of the covenant it's very it's sacred it's sacred you're either part of god's people or you you're not Mm -hmm. You, you are either one of us or you're not one of us and so it's not just circumcision circumcision was the mark that you've made this covenant commitment this conversion and have put yourself into the family of Abraham. But then they also expected them back in verse verse one, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. But then after that, it says in verse five, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So mm-hmm. you're circumcised as that mark that you are part of, you're clean now, you're a proselyte, you're one of God's people. And, and the old law was very clear on the importance of that but then you need to keep the sabbath you need to keep the kosher eating laws you need to be do all of the things that mark you as not one of those people and instead one of us Mm -hmm. and those things die hard yeah i think they had a really specific view of what quote unquote us was Mm -hmm. and they had a really hard time letting go of their previous definition of us I think they were trying to mingle in the old law with the new law in a way that Jesus never intended. And that's essentially what Peter's talking about here. There's no opportunity for us to really hold on to that old law because none of us could actually keep it. We were incapable of keeping it. So why would we hang on to it if we couldn't even bear it? And the fact that it seems they're really willing to listen to this. I just love this whole conversation, honestly, because Mm -hmm. we live in a society now where we're just incapable of this kind of discourse. This would be completely outside of the realm of anything you'd expect today, that people would come together with differing ideas and really sincerely listen to each other and come to a common conclusion, a common understanding to the point where when they make a decision, Everybody is happy about it. Everybody is very encouraged by it. In verse 31, when they had read it, this letter that they had put together, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And I think Mm -hmm. that's just such a mark of their work here, being willing to listen to everyone, everyone's experience, James, Peter, Paul, and Barnabas all coming together, sharing the things that had happened, and coming to an agreement without fighting, without arguing, without dissension or division, their goal was to sincerely know what God wanted them to do. And when they came to that conclusion, they were happy about it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think are the characteristics, the values, the attitudes, the practices that they have going for them that we need to have in order to be able to work things out like they did? They didn't come to the table with preconceptions, I think, is is one of the big things. Mm. Mm -hmm. They just came with their experience. Peter lays out the work that he had done, sharing with them how the Gentiles had also received the Holy Spirit just like the Jews had. And that right there should have been an obvious reason why God accepted them. Paul and Barnabas getting together and saying, you know, we've done all these amazing things in the presence of these Gentiles. And it doesn't say it specifically, but why on earth would God support them in that work if they were misleading the people, if they Mm -hmm. were missing something, if they were not sharing the full gospel of what they needed to tell them? Why would God have been on their side? And then James goes back to scripture. James Mm -hmm. begins quoting Amos and Isaiah here and goes back and says, this was God's plan all along. So I think the big characteristic for me that I see is They sincerely left their egos at the door and just really wanted to know what the right answer was. Right. And didn't have an axe to grind or didn't have their will to put forth. They just really wanted the right answer. That And that last part that you said is critical here. The right answer is what God wants us to do. So Mm -hmm. they're not looking by anybody else's authority. They're reasoning, but they're using reason reasoning with each other, 
trying to establish what God would lead them to. They're only looking to God's authority, whether it's Peter saying what has happened to him by the spirits leading and by these miracles, Paul and Barnabas communicate the, the miracles that God has done. And then, like you said, James in scripture, but all of it is appealing to what God is doing and what God has said. And uh, yeah, I think that's a critical part of it too, as we reason with each other. I just did a sermon on Paul's approach to evangelism and how he reasoned with people. And I brought up how sometimes we say, this guy just can't be reasoned with. Mm -hmm. And there are people who refuse to be reasoned with yeah but that's that's the critical aspect of us being able to work things out is we're not reasoning to or reasoning at each other but we're reasoning with one another thinking through we're thinking partners as we try to look not to what what we want but what god has revealed well and another interesting aspect of this that we may not think about is not very long before this Jesus himself was speaking to people directly, thinking about Ananias, thinking about Saul, all these people. And here in this case, the Lord is silent to them and he is only letting them work this out. And I think that's important because Mm -hmm. as they look at their experience, as they look to the scriptures, as they look to the works that God is doing in their midst, they have all the evidence they need to come to the right conclusion. So Jesus doesn't need to speak to them and give them the answer because they already have it and they just need to, they need to search for it and come up with it and figure it out on their own. And that's, I guess, kind of this carry on to this disciples conversation that we had last week. Mm -hmm. The master is allowing them to work through these problems on their own. And it's a good skill that we all need to develop. Just really looking at the evidence and figuring out what it is that the Lord has already told us about the answer. That's a great point because it puts them basically in the same camp as we are looking to what the Lord has confirmed that he's approved the, these different examples or things that he's shown he's approving of with signs and that kind of thing and what he has outright said in, yeah. in scripture. Yeah. Great point. Well, if we're all calling all audibles here, I'm going to call <laughs> another one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick the section at the very end of this chapter, which kind of seems like a bad thing especially in light of the unity that we just saw there in Jerusalem. But we see at the very end of this chapter in Acts 15, verse 36, Paul and Barnabas, who were just blood brothers in the work that they were doing, they had traveled all around teaching the gospel to all these different cities, working in different areas for for a year here and time here in this other place. Now there's a problem and there's a division among their understanding of who they want to take with them on the next leg of their journey. They decide they're going to go back and search out all of these churches that they had gone to, return to them, see how they're doing. And Barnabas wants to take John Mark. Paul, not too happy about that idea. And for a very specific reason, because John had decided to abandon them a few chapters earlier in chapter 13, he went home and Paul doesn't really think that he is trustworthy enough to take with them on this next journey. Barnabas being the son of encouragement that he is, he has a lot of faith in John Mark. So he takes him with him and they decide here to split. And there was a sharp disagreement in verse 39. There arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. And so Barnabas takes Mark, Paul takes Silas, and they both go their separate ways. Seems like a a weird transition away from this unity that we just saw to now them separating for a seemingly silly reason. But why do you view this as a good thing? Or is this a good thing, really? Well, I believe that God makes all things work together for good (laughs) to those who love the Lord. So it's kind of like the persecution. God uses this for good. And their intentions, ultimately, both of them have good intentions they're trying to figure out it's it's not about what the gospel is or what they need to teach people it's mm-hmm. about the kind of thing that churches and brethren disagree about today it's about what is the best way to do this work mm-hmm. and one of them says you know what i think we should do it this way and another says uh, you know ha- has another idea 
And so God uses this by having more people hear the gospel, more of the churches that Paul and Barnabas had preached to before encouraged in two different separate trips that they go on. And Mark ends up being, Paul later says, a help to him. He says, send Mark. He's a big help to me. Barnabas is spoken of well by Paul later on in his writings. It's not like this is a problem that is unresolved. It was just a disagreement about the best way to do the work. That's what I see. What what do you see? I don't see this as a bad thing. At the end of the day, they both went out and did good work. And it yeah. was kind of the scattering of the scattered, in a, in a sense. Mm-hmm. They were the ones who were splitting up for good to be done as a result. But I love the way that they have a disagreement, but they don't take it personally. Mm. And like you said, Paul later goes on to talk positively about both Barnabas and Mark. Obviously, he feels very closely to Silas as well. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there's no hurt feelings here, this is not personal. If it were personal, if they were holding grudges, then Paul would be in the wrong. Maybe Barnabas would be in the wrong if he was holding these kinds of grudges. But at the end of the day, it's okay if we disagree on certain things. And like you said, this was not foundational to their faith. That This was just a, an implementation detail that they needed to work out. And that's okay when you disagree mm-hmm. with somebody about small, minor details involving how we do certain things. But don't take it so far that it becomes a source of division for you. And they didn't let that happen. They made this work out in the best possible way so that they could both continue doing their work. And I'm glad that Luke includes this here because it's really relatable for me because I don't always agree with other people about how they do certain things and they don't agree with me. So at the end of the day, if we're sincerely wanting to do the Lord's work, well, then get to work. But just don't expect that everybody's going to work exactly the same way that you are or agree with you in every way. And don't let that become a problem between you and other people. Yeah. And it's not like one of them is trying to go beyond the Lord's authority in the way they're doing it. Like I say, there's just, there's just a lot of, of different ways to do the work. All right. So let's get into our final segment. And that is deep thoughts. And now deep thoughts by Jack Handy. So here we're going to talk a little bit about a topic that we don't talk about very often. And that is fasting. Where do we see fasting in these verses? Because they do it, and they do it for a very important and specific reason. Yeah, we value the example of the church, the early church. While fasting is never commanded in the New Testament, we do see this example of the churches in Acts 13 and verse 3, the church is fasting, and in chapter 14, verse 23, we see that. So we see at the church in Antioch, as they're preparing to send off Barnabas and Saul, it says, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So I think what's happening here is they're already, Barnabas and Saul have already been doing the work of the Lord, but the church is sending them off and saying, we want to be a part of this. We're supporting this work that you're doing. It kind of reminds me of what happens whenever the elders back in the Old Testament laid their hands on the priests and and the priests then became the representatives of the people. Mm-hmm. The whole church here at Antioch is in a way going with Barnabas and, and Saul. They're, they're supporting them, they're praying with them, they're thinking about them, and they're sending them off into this work. But they do it with fasting and prayer because it's something that's important and it's worth setting aside some time and some some efforts to do this. And then you see later on as they're going around, Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey, it says in verse 23, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so... You know, we bring up that first part a lot, (laughs) at least I have certainly brought up that first part a lot. They appointed elders in every church, but I haven't always in the past brought up the second part. They did it with prayer and fasting and committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. I don't think this is saying if you don't fast every time you appoint elders, then you're not doing it scripturally. 
But there is an example here for us to note that this was something important. And so the congregation, it seems, in community with one another had, you might say, a corporate fast. And it doesn't mean every person has had to be involved in it, but they did this with prayer and fasting and committed them to the Lord. So, yeah, what do you take from those two examples here? Well, it was certainly done at two very important, pivotal moments when they're sending Saul and Barnabas off, not to a world that would just love and accept them, but to a world who were going to be very oppositional to them. They'd be thrown into prison multiple times. They'd be beaten. They'd be stoned. They'd be kicked out of cities. All kinds of bad things that were going to happen. So they're sending them off really into a very hostile environment, but they're thinking about them and they're with them. And I view this kind of fasting really as just a unity builder. Let's all Mm. do something to focus on what's most important here and do this in a way and at a time that is pivotal for our growth as the kingdom. And that's also what we see at the end in Acts 14 when they appoint these elders. It's another very pivotal, important moment. Altogether, they are putting in place these men who are going to be responsible for watching out for these people. So they need to make the right choice. They need to pick men who are qualified for this role. They need to pick men who are going to act as shepherds and leaders of these congregations in a way that's going to be protecting them, keeping them safe, especially during this time of of real upheaval in the world and anger really against Christians. But you go back to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6. But Jesus there says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So you put that together with what's happening here. And it's not to say that fasting is purely a private, secretive kind of thing, because here they are doing it collectively as the church. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing it to be seen by people. They're not doing it as a show. It's not some kind of big production that they're making out of this. They're doing it with sincerity. And that's really what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6, especially in terms of prayer. Don't go out onto the street corners and pray in front of everybody or pray these long prayers so that people will think that you're some great person. But do these things in a way that humbles your heart before the Lord, shows the Lord where your priorities are, and that's what they're doing here. It takes away the distraction of these physical needs that we all have of food and helps us focus on something that's more important, especially in really important, pivotal times like they're going through in this in this case. So, Yeah, the unity aspect you're bringing up is is interesting. I haven't thought about that. This is such a... It's such a personal subject, and part of it goes to what you just read. I always think it's funny when people say, nobody fasts in the church. What's the problem with that? <laughs> I always think, you probably wouldn't know if if somebody was fasting yeah. a lot of the time because they're following Jesus' commandment there in a very in, in a very literal way, just, just mm-hmm. taking it to heart and not letting anybody know so that they're not doing it for show. And um, so I think this it happens a lot in the church, but food is very personal. It's, it's important to us. Some people have health issues. Some people have eating issues. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things connected to it. Sometimes we rely on food for more than just physical sustenance. And, and I think People, maybe we, we could get defensive or say, you know, um, somebody's trying to bind something on us that the New Testament doesn't bind. And that is very true. We, I think we should be careful not to say that if you're not fasting, then you're somehow less holy than someone else. I don't see that at all in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But the wrong move would be to therefore just avoid the subject completely, this subject that Jesus spoke about, this subject that we see the, the early church practicing, and certainly it was also important in in the, the lives of many people in the Old Testament and in the Lord's himself. So I think uh, it's worth noting that 
we are not saying you need to go and start fasting. If you haven't fasted before, you, you want to think very carefully about it um, and, and maybe start slow. Make sure that you're healthy enough to fast. And also, there are other ways to fast besides just food. And I know mm-hmm. this sounds like a like a disclaimer, uh, <laughs> just to like a legal disclaimer or something, but <laughs> I'm not really trying to protect us from lawsuits or anything like that. I just <laughs> want people to understand this is a sensitive subject and, right. and we understand why it is and, and you want to approach it as such. But all of that said, it is a really valuable practice for, for, for me I don't want to pretend that I do it all the time. I, I really don't. I, I do intermittent fasting for health a lot more than I do spiritual fasting, and that's a totally different thing. Yeah. But it is a really important and valuable practice, at, at, and certainly at different times, I think we might as well just share, at different times in our lives, you and I have, and, and other brothers, have fasted mm-hmm. together, and that's a really, really good thing to do. You know, maybe... Maybe whenever you're going to have, you're going to make a difficult decision or you're going to go through something as a church and, and do something, uh, start a new work or, you know, a, a important life moment, having a child, having a, you know, you're going to get married and you're planning for it and you're thinking about it. You're going to go into a period of prayer. And Jesus did this often before he chose the disciples. He went into a period of prayer and you see the, the fasting that he did before he started his ministry and and these moments are important and so prayer and fasting are inseparable you can pray without fasting but it would be really silly to fast without praying if you're mm-hmm. engaging in a spiritual fast like this and i think it's interesting how whenever you fast you have one less thing to worry about your food and there's this kind of private sense of devotion that you can bring to every moment of your day, knowing this has kind of a, a special purpose that you're bringing to it. And mm-hmm. one, one of our friends brought up once as we were all talking about this, that hunger even serves a purpose because every time you get hungry, that reminds you of the purpose that you're praying about and the purpose of your fast. And I think that's a, a really helpful note as we go through this. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, in the book Celebration of Discipline that we've referenced a few times on this show by Richard Foster. He has a section in there talking about fasting. One of the things that I recall him saying in there is how little instruction is actually given to the subject of fasting. How do you fast? How long should you fast for? What do you do when you fast? And how do you stop fasting? And all these things that we may wonder about because it's just not something that we have as part of our culture. But when Jesus talked about fasting, the Jews understood what that meant. Mm -hmm. They knew exactly what fasting was because they were doing it. It was just part of a natural piece of their culture that Jesus didn't really have to give a lot of explanation about. But there in Matthew chapter 6, when he's talking about all these things, he puts fasting right in the middle of prayer and of giving. And in both of those other cases, we don't have any problem necessarily praying in the presence of other people. We don't necessarily have any problem giving and having some other people know about it. I mean, these are two aspects of our worship that we do pretty much every Lord's Day when we get together. We give and we pray together. Mm -hmm. And this idea of fasting kind of couched in the middle of these other things in the context of what he's saying there, really, it's not about hiding this. It's not about keeping it a super secret from everybody, but it's the mentality behind it. Why do we do it? And if it's being done purely out of praise from other people, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. But if we're doing it because we sincerely want to draw closer to the Lord and we sincerely want to stay focused on him, and this is something that we are committed to and the reasons why we're doing it are pure, well, then there's no problem. And there's no reason why we can't do this collectively like the church does here. And I don't think there's any room for us just to be dismissive about the topic. Because it is something that we see in the Bible. It's something we see faithful people doing for a very specific reason. And if they did it, well, then it must be useful. There must be a purpose in it. Absolutely. I think when you are able to do it with the right mindset, with the right attitude behind it, you see that value there. 
especially when you do it in community with other people, when you do it for a very important, significant reason, you see the focus that it brings to that moment and the clarity that it helps to bring when you really just keep your desires at bay. And I think even beyond just Mm -hmm. the topic of giving up food, keeping our desires at bay, being self-controlled is a super important thing that we always need to be doing anyway. And then that's just, in my mind, in, in some sense, it's almost like lifting spiritual weights, just training yourself to be able to let go of things that are not critical to the most important life that we have, and that's our spiritual life. Yeah, it's a discipline. It's, it's, I, I think that's a great way to say it. You're, you're lifting weights, you're building self-control in one particular area, and it's an area we all feel that human pull towards yeah, to, to eat again. Mm-hmm. And so it's strengthening you, and it's also communicating something to God whenever we do that. And it's not like we're trying to do this as a work that is going to force (laughs) God or somehow encourage God to answer our prayers more because he sees, no, I really mean it. But it is, in a sense, an, an exclamation mark on a prayer in that we are just focusing all of our attention on this prayer and and we're giving our devotion and attention to what our hearts are are asking about. So we've had a lot of asterisks and caveats and all kinds of <laughs> disclaimers in this segment, probably more than normal. Yes. But at the same time, it should be said that you cannot find a specific command to fast in the New Testament. But I think we do see that if it was valuable for the church, if it was valuable for Jesus, maybe it's valuable for us too. Yeah. And it's something to think about. Yeah. I, I think sometimes too, we think of it as an Old Testament practice, but it's only really commanded once in the Old Testament for as far as a, a time in the old law, they had to had to fast. And that was for one day on the Day of Atonement. So mm-hmm. even in the Old Testament, this is a almost always a voluntary practice. It's something that people do as part of their prayer life whenever they, as you started out saying, whenever there's, they have something really important to pray about. Well, and that is, again, not even something that's directed necessarily to the Jews. You can go back to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, when he preaches to Nineveh and they repent. What do they do? In verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. A bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of non-Jewish people who believed in the Lord, repented, turned to him. The very first thing they do is they fast Mm -hmm. and they mourn. They stick a flag in this moment and say, this is important and we really mean this. And it's just a thing that is not even so much specifically geared toward super religious people. Fasting is just a, a way throughout the Bible we see people exclaiming that this is an important moment and I really, really mean this. So that's the challenge for this week, to fast or to give up something for one day this week. I know my wife at times has given up the internet or social media or people will give up. That's a good one. Yeah. Give up television, give up uh, a a lot of different things. You could say, I'm going to give up and focus that extra time and attention on prayer. But you might consider fasting in the traditional sense, just like the church's that we read about in Acts 13 and 14 and make sure that you're doing it for the right reason to devote your attention to communing with God and praying to him. Sounds good. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into the Bible Geeks podcast. You can find us on our website at BibleGeeks.fm. You can also find show notes for this episode at BibleGeeks.fm slash 53. We're on social media. We're all over the place. Go check us out and find our daily download series. That's at BibleGeeks.fm slash daily. Until next week, everyone, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Shalom.